Okay, live stream is up. Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? Recording the computer started. Recording to the cloud or set. Thank you. Sergeant Sandowski, with your opening statement, please. Yes. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Public Housing. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for attending today's hearing by the Committee on Public Housing. I am Council Member Alika Ampre Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee. This morning, I am joined by Council Member Diaz Sr., Council Member Riley, Council Member Traeger, Council Member Jonai, Council Member Feliz, and Council Member Van Bramer. Nearly two years ago, in January 2020, this committee convened a hearing on the very same topic we're here today to discuss, NYCHA's preparedness for the heat season. The adequate provision of heat and hot water has been a persistent issue at NYCHA. And today the committee is interested to learn what progress NYCHA has made since it entered into the HUD agreement and whether NYCHA has delivered on its duty to provide decent, livable housing for its residents. The laws of New York City require that property owners provide adequate heat and hot water to tenants. This means hot water 365 days a year, a minimum internal temperatures must be maintained from October 1st through May 31st. These requirements apply to all property owners, private, and public. Today, we are talking about NYCHA's 713 boilers, 1,492 vacuum tanks, and 847 instantaneous water heaters. In 2020, the Federal Monitor approved a heating plan which established policies to monitor heating metrics and create a 24 seven heat desk, which would dispatch staff to correct deficiencies during the heat season within a maximum of 48 hours. Today, we expect to hear the progress of these policies and the real time assessment regarding the success of its implementation. This is not supposed to be an aha or a got you moment at all. Best practices evaluate benchmarks, assess and reassess progress, those are the goals of reducing disruption to heat service and faster restoration that is being met. And if not, what can we do differently? This is the time to be introspective and transparent as the 48 hour maximum outage time is, to set, is set to decrease a 24 hour maximum outage time by 2024. This committee expects an update on the implementation of this plan and whether it has succeeded in meeting its goals thus far. In addition to hearing about heat and hot water service, the committee expects an update on the many reports of service interruptions to gas and electricity at NYCHA developments, especially since 2012 Superstorm Sandy, thousands of residents at a time have struggled with reoccurring outages reoccurring utility outages. Some resident families rely on generators to keep their lights on. And others are spending as many as several months waiting for gas service to be restored. And I cannot count how many times I've received calls from residents requesting hot plates and asking that million dollar question, how long will my gas be out? To which I never have an answer. There are policies in place, so we know what the answer should be in theory, but what is actually happening in practice? 
When outages are classified as chronic and thousands of residents are making identical complaints, we cannot say that these are isolated events or out of the norm. This is the norm and it's always unacceptable. So how will we do better? As I've said over and over and over again, these conditions will be unacceptable for any New York City landlord. And so there's no reason why we should consider them acceptable for NYCHA. As always, the goal today is to listen, first and foremost, to our NYCHA residents and to learn how the City Council can improve the provisions of essential services to our families and neighbors that are residents of the New York City Housing Authority. With that, I wanna quickly thank committee staff, Audrey Sun, Ricky Chale, Jose Condi, and Luke Zangerlier, and my staff, Naomi Hopkins and Everton Smith. And I will now turn it over to our committee counsel, Audrey Sun, to go over some housekeeping matters for today's hearing. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. I'm Audrey Sun, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we proceed, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it's your turn, I'll call your name and you will be prompted to unmute. Uh, so we will uh, begin the hearing with testimony from the administration. Um, but before that, I would just like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by council member Ayala. Um, so now we'll turn to testimony from the administration. Uh, a reminder to all council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to ask any questions. After the administration, we will hear from uh, any members of the public who are present to testify. I will now administer the oath to the administration, which is represented by Brian Honan, Javier Amoldovar, Vito Mustachulo, and Calcedonia Bruno. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Vito Mustachulo? I do. Javier Amoldovar? Audrey, um, we are having trouble getting some of our staff um, in, um, in the room. Um, Javier, Cal, a few others have been um, having trouble with the link. Um, so they're not here right now. Okay, are you able to proceed with testimony um, without them or do you need a minute for them to be able to join? I think I if we can- Cal joined. Okay, if Cal just joined, then we just have to get Javier, but um, we'll work on it while the uh, um, general manager reads testimony and, uh, and then we can move on from there. Um, okay. Okay, so I'll just continue to administer the oath to those present and then once um, the rest of NYCHA is represented, I'll re-administer the oath to those who- Thank you. Like Thank you. Okay, remind, remind me whose names I've called already. Uh, Javier was the last one you did. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Calcedonia Bruno? Present, I do. And Brian Honan? Um, yes. Thank you very much. You may begin when ready. Okay. <clears throat> Chair Alika, Ampri Alika Ampri Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing and other distinguished members of the City Council. Good morning. I am Vito Mustachulo, NYCHA's Chief Operating Officer. I am pleased to be joined by Javier Amaldivar, Director of NYCHA's Heating Management Services Department, Calcedonia Bruno, Vice President of Operational Analysis and Contract Management, and other members of NYCHA's team. NYCHA's more, NYCHA's more than 20, uh, 12,000 employees show up to work every day with one goal in mind, to provide our residents with a safe, decent, and supportive home. I appreciate this opportunity today to discuss our efforts to deliver heat and hot water to our residents, along with other basic services. This is at the core of our responsibilities as a landlord, and we know how impactful service interruptions can be for our residents. With the support of Mayor de Blasio over the past several years, 
we have made significant improvements to the way we deliver services to our residents. Together with our Blueprint for Change strategies to transform the authority, these operational changes are enabling us to better serve our residents and improve their quality of life. That includes our work to improve heating services. As a result of these efforts, we have reduced the time it takes to restore heat outages by nearly 20%, from 8.8 hours in 2018-2019 to 7.3 hours in 2020-2021, and brought down the number of outages by 52%. In addition to Mayor de Blasio's support, NYCHA's transformation is guided by the HUD agreement signed in January of 2019, as well as our partnership with our residents, the Federal Monitor, HUD, and others in the community, including members of the Council. In December of 2019, Federal Monitor Bart Schwartz approved our Heating Action Plan, which we developed in partnership with his team and in accordance with the requirements of the HUD agreement. The Action Plan outlines the procedures and protocols we follow to prevent and respond to outages in our aging heating plants. It also details how we communicate with residents about outages and repairs, provide warming centers in certain scenarios, and investigate outages that cannot be restored within 12 hours. We posted the action plan on our website, informed resident leadership about it, and trained staff. We also created individual heating action plans for every development in our portfolio and posted them on our website. These individual plans acknowledge that each development has its own unique challenges, which need to be addressed. For instance, Baruch Houses is in a flood zone and is susceptible to constant flooding, and its boilers have exceeded their life expectancy, requiring frequent melt welding. This development is getting a new direct steam station that's elevated nearly 15 feet above sea level, as well as other improvements. It should be noted that many of Baruch's outages last year were planned for construction-related work, and that the rate of outages there has declined. As, ex as another example, in line with the action plan for Whitman Houses, we replaced the development's mobile boiler with a new boiler plant, instantaneous hot water heaters and vacuum tanks. In accordance with the HUD agreement, we are required to restore all outages within an average of 12 hours, faster than what is required for a private landlord, with 85% of the outages having to be resolved within 24 hours. In the last heat season, we met this requirement by, res by resolving 92% of total outages within 12 hours. Fewer than 1% of outages, one outage actually, lasted longer than 24 hours. No heating outages lasted more than 48 hours compared to one outage in 2019, 2020. In addition, we are working more closely with our sister agencies and utility partners to improve the response to gas and electrical outages. For gas outages, that means working with DOB the Department of Buildings and National Grid and Con Edison to complete the inspections, permitting process and service restoration as quickly as possible. And in the event of a gas outage, NYCHA will con connect residents to New York City Human Resources Administration, which can provide a restaurant allowance for meal purchases and to not-for-profit organizations that deliver meals. Our heating operation is vast and our nearly 2,200 buildings across the city we have nearly 1,400 boilers, and about 1,800 pieces of distribution equipment, and around 1,700 water heaters. Our 624 full-time heating staff include heating plant technicians, maintenance workers, plumbers, oil burner specialists, electricians, electrician helpers, and their supervisors. They maintain systems that span boiler plants, heating distribution pipes, and apartment radiators. NYCHA's building and infrastructure are old. So it's unfortunate, it's an unfortunate real, reality that there will be breakdowns in our heating equipment and systems. But in focusing on preventive maintenance and repairs and implementing operational improvements, we've been able to reduce the number of outages. The number of total heat outages decreased from 1,224 in 2018-2019 to 819 in 2019-2020 to 584 last heat season a 52% reduction. We introduced planned outages scheduled for warmer days in 2018-2019 heat season so that we can do necessary repairs to improve the heating system's performance and prevent unplanned outages when the weather is colder. In the last heat season, there were 120 planned heat outages restored within an average of seven hours. 
Every year we strive to improve and to minimize outages, planned or unplanned, and any impacts to our residents' quality of life. By focusing intensely on our response, we've also been able to reduce the length of outages considerably. From 2018-2019 heat season to last year's heat season, we brought down the average time to restore total outages by nearly 20%, again, from 8.8 .8 hours to 7.3 hours, below the 12-hour restoration target. We want to keep bringing these numbers down even more. To improve heat services for residents, we have implemented a 24-7 staffing model for repair teams, established a 24-7 heat desk that monitors potential service disruptions from various data and dispatches staff accordingly, hired 70 additional heating plant technicians. We brought on 56 plumbers and 12 electricians dedicated to resolving heating issues as part of our enhanced staffing model. We've established the Situation Room to coordinate and focus our resources on expediting service restoration when necessary. We set up daily calls to strategize, strategize the service issues. We've created a schedule of annual preventive maintenance, inspections, and heating equipment so any unnecessary or necessary repairs can be made. We've procured third-party management of heating plants at over 40 developments and are utilizing contractors for specialized repairs across our portfolio. We have in place 67 mobile boilers um, placed as needed and also staged in geographic areas. We've developed a process to open warming centers for residents when necessary. In addition, we are investing 28 million in city operating funding to replace approximately 400 heating equipment components such as hot water boiler replacements, heat control panels and tanks. We are also working to improve the tracking of outages and assets and examining with the monitors team the root cause of outages to prevent future occurrences. As part of our transformation efforts, we enhanced, enhanced our communication with residents. That means we are now ensuring that residents are notified of outages or in advance of scheduled repairs through building flyers and robocalls, enabling residents to automatically let us know if they're still experiencing a service disruption when they receive robocalls, alerting them of service restoration. This data helps us better address lingering issues. We also post information about outages on our website, as well as apartment temperatures for the developments where we're installing indoor temperature sensors. Our website provides more transparency than ever before, enhancements guided by our discussions with advocates and residents. We're also posting information about outages on social media. We have improved the process for collecting resident data on outages in other ways, such as by updating the questions residents are asked when submitting heat complaints through the Customer Contact Center or MyNYCHA app. This facilitates issues diagnosis, diagnosis and repair staff deployment. In addition, we rolled out an upgraded MyNYCHA app that will allow residents to receive notifications about outages on their smartphones. We do request that residents report issues through either CCC or MyNYCHA system as this enables us to most effectively respond to issues. MyNYCHA is available in Spanish and our CCC representatives can connect callers to an interpreter who speaks their language. Since it was launched in 2016, nearly 112,000 residents have used MyNYCHA app to create over 2 million work orders. <clears throat> Excuse me. To improve heat services for our residents for the long term, we must replace aging faulty infrastructure while we make operational improvements. Over the next several years, we are replacing 359 boilers across 80 developments with approximately 2 billion in city, state, and federal funding. Since 2019, we have installed 47 boilers as part of this pipeline. Keep in mind that outages are not always due to boiler failures. They are often due to issues with other parts of NYCHA's aging infrastructure such as the distribution system and other heating components. An example of this is the recent issue at Woodside Houses, which needs its entire advanced management system replaced, including the burner, the combustion control, computer module, feed water, sump pump, and gas valves. This is why we are taking a comprehensive approach to improving heat service, planning investments in heating systems as a whole, underground distribution systems, pipes and walls, heating components and boilers. And we're not just replacing in kind, but are putting in place more effective systems. 
For example, to improve hot water services, we're incorporating modern designs in our new heating plants, decoupling hot water equipment from heating equipment so that issues with one don't affect the other. We are also, where possible, electrifying gas stoves, moving away from steam distribution, and improving the building envelope, all things that help reduce outages and keep residents safe and comfortable. HUD's Energy Performance Contracting, or EPC, enabled us to replace boilers and modernize heating systems with the assistance from energy service companies without spending capital dollars up front. The improvements are funded by the cost savings from reduced energy consumption. Last year, we finished investing over 300 million at 70 developments through four EPCs, several years ahead of schedule and beyond our initial investment goal. By installing a building management system and apartment temperature sensors at 47 developments, we can now monitor building temperatures and heating and hot water systems in real time. The system improves the distribution of heat throughout the buildings, reduces overheating and underheating, and makes the heating system greener and more energy efficient. These new controls generally provide temperatures of 72 to 74 degrees above New York City's requirement of 68, though lower than some residents may be accustomed to. NYCHA is also taking advantage of direct install programs with local utilities. Through these programs, local vendors are compensated by the utilities to repair and replace apartment radiator valves and traps at no cost to NYCHA. This work improves steam, steam distribution and residents' comfort. Through the state's weatherization assistance program, we plan to bring 30 million in energy and water efficiency upgrades, including new boilers to up to 8,000 apartments and 65 developments. To date, nearly 15 million of the work is underway or complete at 32 developments. In 2019, NYCHA released a design build RFP with the goal of transitioning the heating and domestic hot water producing systems at eight developments to high efficiency, clean electric heat pumps. These and other technologies lead towards the decarbonization of our buildings for local law 97, greenhouse gas reduction goals, while also enhancing the system's performance and resident comfort. In 2020, we released an RFP seeking a team to retrofit a select building to achieve near net zero energy performance by 2021. Together with our other energy efficiency work, this trailblazing first of its kind demonstration project will help with the city meet its ambitious climate goals while improving residents' quality of life. As part of this work, we recently released a five-year update to our sustainability agenda, which developed a roadmap for cutting edge technologies, such as electric heat pumps and geothermal and hydronic conversions. As NYCHA advocates for new funding to recapitalize our assets, other ways we will improve service to residents include issuing more user-friendly handholds for staff, developing a plan to assist vulnerable residents in the event of a heat outage, and creating a work order quality assurance program while we evaluate each heating season as well as our resident communication systems. We will also continue to install apartment temperature sensors at a total of 60 developments, technology that enables us to better deploy staff and analyze data. Providing reliable and comfortable heat is one of our top priorities as we work to improve our delivery of service to residents. We are committed to continued progress in this area by making substantial improvements to our operations, as well as strategic investments from new heating plants and systems to improve staffing models. Our residents' quality of life drives everything we do, especially when it comes to delivering basic services such as heat and hot water. While we have reduced the time it takes to restore heat outages and the number of outages significantly, there's more work to be done. Thank you very much for your partnership with your support and the support of other members of the community. We will keep making a difference for our residents. We look forward to our continued collaboration on NYCHA's transformation, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Vito. Thank you so much. Um, we have also been joined by Majority Leader Lori Combo. So just getting started, jumping right into it. Can you? Um, sorry, Chair. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Just really quickly before they begin, uh, I I'd like to in, administer the oath to Javier Amoldovar um, so that he can be ready to answer questions on the record. 
Thanks. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Audrey. Please define an outage for us. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, outages are defined as two different types. Have a planned outage, and we also have unplanned outages. Unplanned outages. Planned outages are um, <clears throat> correct the condition identified and cause a service disruption if left unattended. Uh, it's a corrective maintenance um, protocol that we follow. So when we visit some of these sites during our routine inspections of the boiler rooms and and ancillary equipment rooms, if we see something that may require attention, we schedule an unplanned outage to address it. I'm sorry, a planned outage to address it. Control uh, service disruption, we take the system down. We have all the staff and all the material in place to correct that, that condition. So in essence, it's a corrective maintenance. The second reason why we would create a planned outage is for ongoing capital improvement work. We want to meet the, uh, the the schedule of the construction work so that we complete the work on time. And so we work with capital projects and the contractors to, to create planned controlled service disruption so that they can perform their work and stay on schedule. So that's a planned outage. Now, an unplanned outage is the exact opposite. It's, it, it's they're created uh, for unforeseen events. If something happens where the system goes down unexpectedly, then we create an unplanned outage. In both cases, um, create outages for either a development, building, a stair hall, or apartment line. And again, in both cases, residents in the affected area receive a robocall. The difference between the two is that with a planned outage, the robocall goes out 48 hours in advance of the scheduled work and the scheduled takedown of the, uh, of the system. And unplanned, it, the robocall goes out within the hour of the creation of that uh, planned outage. Thank you. How many heat and hot water outages have occurred so far this heating season? I think we're 12 days into it. Yeah, we've had, we, we haven't had the, the uh, uh, need to provide Heat because the temperatures have been above 55 since the start of October. And so because of that, we've had no heating outages at all. All of our outages, total of 81, have been for no hot water. Okay, so for all of the outages that were no hot water, which ones were planned and which how many were planned and how many were unplanned? 26 were planned and 55 were in time. And if I can give an update as of this morning, we currently have uh, two unplanned um, hot water outages and six planned. And for the ones that were, uh, so for either one, which developments had the most outages so far? So far today? That, and that in, 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 in that same vein, um, when you explain, when you say which developments, can you let us know um, what's unique about that particular development or those particular developments, just to give us a sense of what's going on? So, so un unfortunately, I don't have the exact uh, development that has had the most out, um, outages so far uh, for this heating season, but I do have it for the last heating. Okay, well, you can talk about the last heating season. That's that's fine. Um, and I know, I think the developments are listed. So is there a way to get to, to take a quick look to see those developments and, and maybe compare them to the last heating season? Just as we're talking now. Are we, are we comparing the outages that are on the- uh, The developments themselves. 
because you were just saying you don't have the, the names of the developments for right now, but you can let us know about the last season. And so I'm saying, okay, we can talk about the last season just to see if there's any um, consistency. So I just want to make sure I understand your question. And forgive mm -hmm. me about it. So I'm looking at the website right now and it's listing the developments that have a service disruption. So you're asking me to compare, for example, Castle Hill, which is the one that's on there now, and it's a planned outage, right? Uh, and it's for the installation of a vacuum tank, which is an ancillary piece of equipment. You want to know how this development favored last year? Exactly. To see if there were any lessons learned and if that was part of like plan before. I, 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 <laughs> gotcha. So, so um, it, it, it'll have to be from, from memory because I don't have the exact information from last year in front of me. But I can tell you that uh, at Castle Hill, um, it's an advanced boiler management system. I had some issues with the advanced boiler management system that was related to some of our ancillary equipment, which is why today we're in building 11, replacing a piece of that ancillary equipment so that we can get the condensate back to the boiler. The next one on the list is Dykeman. Dykeman was, was, didn't favor too badly last year, but at Dykeman, the reason why the outage is going on today Wait, just say it one more time because I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. You just finished talking about Castle Hill, so now you just said something. You're talking about Dykeman now, right? Dykeman. Uh, Councilwoman, yeah. Javier is going down the list of our current open hot water outages. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay, okay. So the current hot water outages, when you said, when you mentioned Dykeman, they're on the current list now, but you right. mentioned something about last year. And so I wanted to get that and, and just oh, I'm sorry. Okay. make it so, clear. So, that is, so there's a point there. Last, last year, Dykeman it didn't do too too badly. It, it wasn't on our radar, in other words. It, it, it fared fairly well. Um, now, as far as the work that's going on at Dykeman today, at Dykeman, this work is actually related to a laundry room that's being installed. It, it really has nothing to do with our equipment. We took the equipment down so that the construction of that laundry room can continue. We have steam fitters on site right now that are making some connections to that laundry room and that's why we took the system down. Okay, right. now go back to Castle Hill. Castle Hill. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so go back so go back to Castle Hill. What is happening now and then compare it to just from your memory like you were saying just kind of going off of memory what so, was happening. So at, at, at Castle Hill what's going on now we're replacing a piece of ancillary equipment in one of the tanks. It's a vacuum tank. It helps with heat distribution and condensate return to the boiler. Uh, Castle Hill has an advanced boiler management system in the boiler room that controls the entire plant that um, records uh, uh, condensate coming back and, and steam output. And so what we, by replacing this piece of equipment, we're hoping to improve the condensate return from the system back to the boiler and prevent any, any uh, uh, service disruptions that may be related to the lack of condensate return from the, from the system. The boiler. Okay. Okay. And how many, just looking at your current list right now in front of you, we're not talking about heat because of the temperature. Right now it's warm outside. We're talking about hot water. So, um, how many individual residents um, have been impacted due to the lack of hot water? So, so, so for in total, for for planned is uh, 1,594, and unplanned is 2,454, which would be two, three, uh, roughly 4,080 residents about, roughly. Okay, and I know that there's, a, again, a difference between planned and um, unplanned. So what's the average time to restore hot water? Uh, currently, right now, we're at nine hours right now. Okay. And um, it's going back to heat. What is the average time to restore heat? So Just going back to what the actual requirements are. That, that's, that's, a very, that's a very good question. So the requirement is, is 12 hours. And for the past three heating seasons, we, we've met that requirement and actually showed a reduction in the uh, number of hours to restore. Last heating season, we ended at 7.3 hours, 7.3.
Uh, heating season before that, we were at 7.7. We're talking about heat, right? And the, the heating season before that, we were at 8.7, almost nine. Okay, now can you go back? So, um, and, I, and I do wanna say, Vito, just in your opening testimony, I was pretty um, impressed, a little shocked at those numbers. I think you quoted some 92% um, and I thought that was pretty, it's pretty good. Thank you. Right? Um, We're doing better. We're doing much better. Okay. Um, you know, but I do have to say there were no residents to testify this morning. And so we used to hear it a different story, so we're going to go with it right now. <laughs> well, we're not perfect, Councilwoman, but, we're, but we are doing better. I know, I know, I know. Um, but just going back to, to, wait a minute now. Your communication to the residents and what your numbers tell you, um, how reliable um, is the actual system itself, the, the data that you um, have on Maximo? Like what, how reliable is that system right now? And can you just talk a little bit about the system? You wanna talk about the system Maximo? The how reliable is NYCHA's data on Maximo? Uh, I would say it's, it's, it's pretty reliable. I mean, it's uh, Maximo tracks all of our work orders and um, while we create them, they, the, the system automatically closes them out in the system. So it's pretty accurate. Yeah, and if I could also add, Councilman, um, you know, the interactive um, IVR system that we put in place uh, when we restore heat or hot water, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when the outage is declared restored, right, we do send a, a robocall out to the residents and it does encourage them to um, respond, to tell us, yes, uh, it's been corrected or no, it has not been. Um, I don't have this, the statistics on the IVR calls from last year. We can certainly get them to you, um, but it was fantastic. It was great because it helped us identify where there were still issues that our residents were experiencing in their apartments, even though our technicians, our staff, made the repairs in the boiler room. Right? So, so that has been a tremendous tool. Um, I think the other you know, value point that I wanna make too is especially uh, for this year, you know, Javier and his team started uh, doing the overhauls, the inspections uh, as early as February uh, to ensure that we go into this heat season in much better shape. Uh, we also um, weekly, uh, and in fact, and sometimes even more often, um, have conversations with the federal monitors team. Right? And what they've been doing is sending staff out as well uh, to evaluate our heating plants. And they've been sending us reports that are invaluable. It's a third set of eyes that are being put on the heating plants. We had a great conversation with the federal monitor and HUD last week about the use of these reports. Um, I wanna thank Dan Brunell um, from the federal monitors team um, and his staff who are really on top of these issues. Um, and in fact, um, what was also unique about this year is HUD kind of gave us a challenge and just gave us a scenario and asked us to play out the scenario. Um, and I think we did extremely well. Again, always room for improvement, um, but I think that with the collaboration with the Federal Monitor, um, with HUD, and with all of our external partners, um, it's, it's keeping us on, on our toes. Uh, and Javier is constantly improving on the process. Um, our staffing levels are better than we've ever seen before. Uh, this year, we transferred electricians and electrician helpers over to Javier. So he has direct control over now plumbers and electricians all to support his operation. Um, so we've made a lot of fundamental fundamental changes. Um, in communication, you know, there's always room for improvement. Uh, I think we're doing much better, um, but certainly more room to more work to be done. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate that because that was, you know, just looking at the, you know, right now we're at the beginning of the heating season. So we don't have a lot of, you know, like current right. information to go off of. And just looking at the numbers from last year and listening to your testimony, um, that's what made me ask that question. How reliable is the data? Because you know that's sure. that's all we have to go with right now. Um, and so, uh, um, and Councilmember, can I just add too, uh, to on what Vito said too? So, um, 
the IVR system that was set up uh, with the robocalls that are interactive, that's something that the council and especially this committee really encouraged um, in response to the batch closings. Um, before the criticism war was that a um, residents would call in uh, an issue, an outage would be declared, the um, heating system would come back and then the work orders were closed. Javier and his team and, 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 and you know, with the leadership of, of, of Vito have now made it, um, we don't close them until we're hearing from residents that they're actually receiving heat. So it is, it's much, it's much better, it's much more accurate and we're hearing less reoccurring problems as a result. That is huge. That, that is definitely huge. And um, I, I wanna just touch on something quickly before we move on um, into the federal monitor questions. Um, well, questions related to the agreement. Vito, you mentioned the energy performance contract program. And in your testimony, you said this system- is Steve loves you. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Um, you talked about a development um, that was able to be modernized, and um, I just wanted to ask questions about, oh, here it is. The system improves the distribution of heat throughout buildings, reducing overheating and underheating. It makes the, the heating system greener and more efficient. These new controls generally provide temperatures of 72 to 74 degrees, above New York City's requirement of 68 degrees though lower than some residents may be accustomed to. And so I just wanted to touch on that. How is that going and can you speak to that? Because um, I do know the required temperature is you know, clearly much lower than some residents are accustomed to. We're used to having 75 degrees, especially in our senior buildings. So can you speak to um, the opportunity to have a warmer temperature in some of these buildings? Sure, I'm gonna start and then I'm going to ask Javier to, to kind of jump in as well. Uh, so the system that we're talking about there really, it monitors the internal temperatures. <clears throat> and and um, we, we're following that very closely. Um, the system is, as I mentioned in my testimony, designed to maintain uh, and regulate the heat between 72, 74. Um, without these controls and without these, um, these um, sensors, that we've historically overheated our buildings, um, providing temperatures sometimes in, in the upper 70s. Um, and I've been out to a number of our buildings and took temperature readings, sometimes up to 78, even 82 degrees. Um, that was my comment about um, um, perhaps some residents were accustomed to seeing higher temperatures. Um, but I also wanna thank the city council because when I was at HPD, um, something that, that we had worked hard on uh, was to increase the nighttime temperature. Uh, and I'm grateful to the council for, for doing that. Uh, so the nighttime temperature now is 62 degrees. Before that, it was, uh, it was much, much lower. Um, it was only 55. Um, so there have been significant um, improvements and that's for all property owners. Um, but we're able to better um, control the temperatures um, with these sensors. Um, and again, it makes for a much more uh, energy efficient um, heating system. It does get some use, some getting used to for our residents because you know, they may see fluctuations. It may drop down to 70, 72 degrees before the heat uh, turns back on and brings it back up to 74. Um, so it, you might see some fluctuations um, as opposed to a constant uh, temperature. But Javier, do you wanna to add to, to what we've experienced with these systems? And Javier, before you start, I just wanted to um, also put into context too that a lot of the calls that we get, you know, it's either, it, it's just way too cold, right, or way too hot. And then when someone goes out with their, you know, with their instrument, their their tool, they will say that it's appropriate temperature, you know, or it's like maybe a different timing. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, Javier. Um, so what first let me just touch a little bit more about how the system actually works. It, yes, it's regulating the indoor temperature. The way it does that is that this is the part that the residents are not too accustomed to as well. It 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 um shuts the system down when the temperatures reach the the set point of 74, 174. You guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Just lost. 
see Cal Bruno, he's the only person I've seen out. Um, at any rate, so uh, the system shuts down, and when it shuts down, once it's satisfied, uh, you don't feel the heat in the pipes, and that's that's the part that the residents are most not accustomed to. And so what we find is that when the system does shut down, uh, getting more cold, and when we go into the apartment, while well, the, the system may, may not be activated at that time, the temperatures in the apartment are actually within the range. That, that's why you're hearing from many residents that, that it's either too cold or it's too hot and the temperature's still not where I want it to be. The system is designed to, to um, shut down at that high point, which is 74, 74, 75, and then it kicks back in at around 70, and it regulates between that, those two temperature settings. Got it. But again, what, what we've been finding is that, that when the system is, is on the closed uh, end of it, there's no heat going through the uh, pipe. That's where we see an increase in uh, our borders. I see Vito has his hand raised. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, I also want to add, too, that when we install these systems, we do have a program that that where we try to inform our residents about these new systems. Uh, it's an educational program, uh, so we are communicating with our residents. It's it's a bit it's different for a lot of our residents, so it does take some getting uh, accustomed to. Uh, but we do have um, outreach staff that go and meet with the residents. They uh, talk about these new systems, um, and we do that in advance of the systems coming online. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. I just wanted to touch on that um, before I forget to ask a question about temperatures. So jumping directly into the next conversation, the federal monitor is tasked to assist NYCHA to seek regulatory relief from HUD, the city of New York and the state of New York. Has NYCHA identified or flagged regulations they need relief from? And if so, what are they? Um, and how do these regulations impede NYCHA, just the work that you're doing. So can you just speak a little bit about, you know, you mentioned already that you've had conversations with the federal monitor. Um, can you just talk about some of the flag regulations and relief? So Javier and, and his team and Vito and his team meet with the monitor weekly. Um, we can't speak, you know, for them and I wouldn't even try to pretend to, but I, I, I can tell you what we've done so far. Um, early on in, you know, after so, the- so, just remind, so remember, I'm not asking about the federal monitor. I'm just asking what have yep. you asked? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to start off there. I it would never want to speak to that team. Um, <laughs> and so um, right away with design build, it was something that we saw was a big pain point, right? Um, and oftentimes, when um, and we went, you know, we helped, you know, in Albany to fight for that to make sure that nature was included when other agencies were getting this benefit. Um, and all of the state funded heating projects and the city funded heating projects are using this method. Um, on top of that, we also um, went to HUD to seek for a waiver to make sure that we could use the benefit that the state um, that the state gave us um, because HUD has some rules against uh, design build and we were able to do that successfully. So right there, we're cutting down on the time for new boiler plants uh, uh, in the construction uh, of them. So that is a major hurdle right there. The, the other, um, pain point that we see right now, and it's something that's included in the trust legislation, um, but we can we can do it separately as well, is around procurement. Right now, NYCHA has to go with the lowest responsive bidder um, when we bid out a project. And oftentimes when you get the lowest responsive, you get a, um, a contractor who comes in low, Later on, there has to be change orders. This causes delay in the project. It also doesn't give you the best um, contractors that are available out there. We would like to go to a system that allows us to go with best value. Um, that gives you better quality contractors who will have more realistic bids. Um, so we can cut down on those change orders. We'll have better projects that will come in on time uh, as well. So right there, those would be two huge things that um, the state can do uh, in order to help us, especially with new, newer plants. 
Okay. Okay. So under the actual agreement, the it states that NYCHA has to replace or address approximately 500 boilers by 2026. So that's um, in the written language. Um, how are you on dealing with this particular target? And is it something that's realistic by 2026? Um, I would leave that to both Javier and Vito on the timelines and the agreement. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was looking for some numbers, but um, I mean, right now we are on target to achieve those goals. Um, if I can get some, some numbers, I, I'll share some numbers with you. Um, but as of right now, we're on target. Oh, and, and I'm just, I, I can't wait for you to answer just like the timelines and targets of the agreement only because, um, you know, everyone else is talking about COVID having uh, been an issue and, you know, some projects are not on track and everything else. So I don't want you to say that you're on target and, you know. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, out of the five hundred. Yeah, yeah and, and COVID certainly did impact um, all of us. Um, and, and our heating department as well as capital. Um, and in fact, it continues to impact us in ways that we didn't even anticipate, um, trying, mm -hmm. trying to find materials and, and parts for uh, for heating plants um, is uh, becoming a challenge. Um, okay, and, and, I'm ask, and, and I'm asking that question too, again, when I say, is it a realistic target? Um, because my next question is, um, does funds have anything to do with you being able to meet that target? And um, what does the does the agreement speak to, you know, those issues? Like, what no, would I, happen if you can't? Because it's just going to cost too much money now, and you don't see where it's coming from. You know, just so just being able to flush through those issues. And I just want my colleagues to know that I'm going to continue to move forward with the questions because I don't see any hands raised. And so, just wanted to put that out there for my colleagues. Okay, so if uh, Councilwoman, if you want to uh, go on to the next question, we're getting the information okay. um, on that question. So I'm um, starting on, uh, so it, it stated that October 1st, 2020, during the heat season, NYCHA would restore heat to effective units within 24 hours and in no event more than 24, I mean, 48 hours when there is a short, oh, I don't even understand. Has NYCHA been able to meet all of its goals during the last heating season of um, making sure that none of the outages went beyond 48 hours? And if not, um, even if it's one development, can you just speak to the why? Why um, were you not able to stick within the 48 hours? And now that we have a new heating season, um, is there any, you know, clearly there's a plan, but what is it? Um, so we have been meeting the, uh, the 12 hour, uh, obligation. You can hear me, right? Just want to make sure. Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, and we, we, this last heating season, as I said, we, we ended the heating season with a, uh, average response time of, of average response time of 7.3 hours for heat. Uh, and, and I think Vito had testified earlier that we were at 92% uh, of the total heat outages were addressed within um, 12 hours. Um, and fewer than 1% of the outages lasted uh, longer than 24, but we had none that went over 48 at all. Um, I don't have the exact details on the one that, forgive me for this, I, I'll, I'll get back to you, of course, the one that went over 24 hours. I don't want to misspeak. so. Would like to give you the, the exact details on, on what happened with that one that went over 24 hours last year. But this year, um, you know, we're, we're, we continue to, to aim to improve year after year. That's always our goal. Uh, and we've been doing that for the past three years. And I'm hoping that this year is no different. Okay. And so, again, it's just to figure out if maybe that one 
um, you know, there's a pattern and what's happening. And if that one um, it will not be the one this year, but there might be a similar development with those same issues. And then that will be the one because the focus was on that other one. And so again, just trying to, you know, get a, a clear understanding as to what's happening because there is still this need to replace and address approximately 500 boilers by 2026. And so just ensuring that you can continue to be on track for providing heat and hot water to all of your customers, to all of your residents, um, just would be helpful. So as you're still trying to figure that out, I am going to, wait, unless you have something to say right now. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna press pause because I do see a hand up for one of my colleagues. So Audrey. Sure, uh, we'll, now, we'll now turn to Council Member Riley for some questions. Uh, just in the interest of time, please uh, be sure to keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council. I, I think I'll be way shorter than five minutes. Um, but I think, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, for, for the question. It was very, uh, very straight to the point. Uh, I think um, my only, my concern this winter is projected to be one of the most coldest winters, um, according to the World Almanac uh, records. And uh, being that a lot of uh, places, like I represent Edenwall, which is a huge complex in my, uh, in my district, and every winter is always a shortage uh, or in a in a building or the heat goes out in the building. So uh, just knowing that this winter will be one of the coldest winters, can you just walk me? I'm sorry if you did this already. I was doing something in the background. But can you just walk me through the procedures uh, if a, a building has to go um, without power or without heat? How do you get the power and heat? How fast um, do you do? Uh, does NYCHA contact the residents? Um, and how fast will the heat um, be put back up um, when it goes out? Okay, so um, what, what we do is through routine uh, site visits, if we notice that a system went down unexpectedly, um, we immediately create an unplanned outage work order. And within the hour of the creation of that outage work order in Maximo, a robocall is sent out to the uh, affected population, right? So if it's a single building, then everyone in that building will get the robocall to inform the residents that there's an issue related to your heat and that we're on it and we're, we're, we're working on it. Now, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say uh, what will break down because you know some of our systems are old, uh, but through our protocols that we have in place, like the routine uh, site visits that we do daily, if we see something wrong, as I just said, we, we make an, uh, uh, an outage work order for that. And in addition to that, we have a 24-hour heat desk that monitors two key performance uh, indicators for us. Uh, the first one is work orders, um, and the other one is CHAS alarms, right? CHAS alarms are our computerized heating automated system. It sends trouble alarms via email to the entire heating staff when there's an issue in a boiler plant. If there's an issue in the boiler plant, as you would imagine, if the plant goes down, then you know the entire system goes down. And so what my heat test does is they monitor those two key performance indicators 24 hours a day. Um, and the work orders, when we see a spike in work orders, whether it's in a single building, a stair hall, or an entire development, then we dispatch staff to that site if we don't have staff on site. As you, as you can imagine, we do have um, staff that work different shifts and uh, the heat desk works, because they work 24 hours, they can, they can dispatch staff accordingly when staff has already gone home. So we do have roving teams that work at night and we do have specific sites that have an AM and PM watch as well. And so if, if Eden Wall is one of those sites and we will communicate with that staff first to make sure that they go and inspect whatever the issue is so that we're responding as quickly as we possibly can. And the goal is to identify what the issue is and assign the appropriate staff to uh, restore that service as quickly as possible. Yeah. Councilmember, Council Member, I hope that you're wrong. 
uh, or the, the the almanac is wrong. Uh, but we so. we are we, yeah, but we are positioned. Um, in, and as Javier said, um, we have a, a really good playbook here, um, and we also are increasing the number of mobile heating plants, um, okay. both that we own as well as that we're renting. Uh, in fact, we're bringing um, six more on um, that we currently didn't have, um, you know, just in preparation uh, for what may be in the inevitable. Um, but that's a last resort. Um, Javier and his team have done a great job in, in getting services restored without us having to install um, a mobile unit. Uh, but we do have those available um, should we need to. Right. Um, Chair, can I go back to your question about the replacement um, for the HUD agreement, the action plan? Only if Riley is finished. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, 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 My I, apologies. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. I, I, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vito. Thank you, Javier. I see Brian Honan on the call. Brian works. I worked very well with Brian for years. So uh, Brian's usually on top of a lot of the issues I have in my district. So thank you very much, Chair. You're welcome. But Bef Vito, before you go back to that, I just need to Absolutely. Can you just clarify again, the parent um, work order um, and the child. Child, sure. <laughs> go ahead, Javier. Up, up, uh, and um, to that, at what point does it actually close? Just to clarify that real quick. So with, with the outage work order, it gets closed after we've confirmed, not only after we've completed the work and, and put the system back online, but after we've confirmed that the services that we provide our residents are, are, are being supplied. So we'll visit a, a number of apartments before, to confirm, of course, before we close that public out. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, Vito. Sure, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so I want to go back to your question about the um, about where we are with respect to the target and the agreement. As of today, um, we are on target to achieve um, the replacement of the 297 boilers um, by the end of 2026. And, and in fact, right now we have 311 replacements that are in various stages um, of progress. Um, and we've already replaced 64. Uh, so, so the 311 at, is out of the 500? Uh, so no, the, the actually uh, CP, the capital is required to replace 297 boilers. Okay. Uh, th that's what we reported uh, to HUD. Um, we can go over the numbers um, you know, later if you like, um, but so we, we are on target. We do have the funds in place uh, to achieve that um, using a combination of city, state and federal dollars. Right. And that's as of today. Um, we don't anticipate any problems. Um, we've been seeing a lot of forward progress. Um, so I'm just looking here. So the agreement requires uh, capital is just to replace 297 boilers by uh, December 31st, 2026. Again, we have 311 that are actively um, in progress. 64 have already um, been replaced. That's against the 297. Uh, and then through, I'm uh, because 311 sure. is more than 297. 297. So, <laughs> so no, so right, right. So, so again, I guess in, in anticipation, we're our, our goal is to do better. Um, we're required to do 297. Okay. Right now we have right now we have 311. Okay. Right. Um, right. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, so we do have a little wiggle room there. And God forbid if, if one or two fall out, um, but we do um, intend on going through with the 311. Um, and again, the funds are, are in place for that. Um, so as of today, we are in good shape with respect to our obligations um, pursuant to the agreement. Okay. All right. Thanks. So um, now I want to ask questions about the city and its obligations and promises that were um, made. On January 31st, 2018, Mayor de Blasio released a press release that stated that the city plans to invest $200 million to replace boilers and upgrade heating systems at 20 nitro developments. This funding was supposed to go towards replacing outdated boilers, modernizing heating system controls, and hot water or hot water making technology. And these renovations would be finished by 2022. So I know you just mentioned um, the work that you're doing and utilizing funding from the city, state, and the feds. But it's just specifically speaking to the 200 million, did NYCHA begin replacing the boilers at? Morris One, Morris Two, Taft, Cypress Hill, Farragut, Sotomayor, 
Wrangell, Florentino, Long Island Baptist, and Robinson. And are we on track to finish these reservations by 2022, which is next year? Does somebody have the page for the phase one and phase two? I'm sorry, just bear with me for one minute. Javier, if you can locate that um, before I or I do, can you? Okay, and while you're looking at that, I just wanted to say this real quick. You know, I feel kind I'm of unmuted. I'm so sorry. I'm on mute. I'm sorry. I, um, while Vito's looking that up, you already know that I do a lot of um, get DMs and stuff, direct messages on social media. So according to residents, sometimes the workers will measure the heat in a bathroom or a kitchen, but not an actual livable space. It's not realistic for a resident to be relegated to one part of their apartment. So when you're talking about closing out a ticket or a work order, can you speak to that specific issue where they a worker will go in and they will close out because there's adequate heat in a bathroom or a kitchen? So we should not be taking temperature readings in kitchens or bathrooms? Oh, okay. No. Um, so we will reiterate that and reinforce that with our staff. Okay. Uh, but we should not be taking the temperature readings in those rooms. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Chair, um, with respect to your question about the, the city capital dollars. Uh, so since the mayor's uh, January 31st, um, 2018 press release, we have begun re um, replacing the boilers at, as you said, Mars 1, Mars 2, Taft, Cypress Hills, Farragut, Sotomayor, Wrangell, Fiorentino, Long Island Baptist, and Robinson. Um, we are track. We are on track to complete these by 2022. Um, what has been completed to date: Long Island Baptist, Fiorentino, Robinson, Sotomayor, um, Taft, and Farragut are scheduled to be complete in 2022. And Mars One, Two, and Marcenia and Wrangell, um, sometime late in 2023. So we're on track right now um, with respect to the city capital commitment. And right, okay. we can send you this information uh, after the hearing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, inspections. During the February 6, 2018 hearing, NYCHA stated that your organization was working on ways to ensure that service tickets were no longer be. Oh, okay. Um, now I'm talking about your communication to the residents. How many NYCHA units are registered with the My NYCHA app? Sure. Well, we don't, I don't have the unit count. I do know that we have right now about 112,000 users. Right. And to date, since the implementation of the app, um, they have collectively put in about 2 million more tickets. Oh, 112,000 users on the My Night Chat app. So those and those right. are all the residents. Those are all residents. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to stop there. We have been joined by council member Salamanca. And I do see that our majority leader combo has her hand raised. So I'm going to stop there. Audrey. Sure. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Majority Leader. Uh, we'll now turn to questions from you. Uh, in the interest of time, please keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, following the Majority Leader, we will move to questions from Council Member Salamanca. Your time will begin. 
Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Chair Amprey Samuel, for conducting this very important hearing today. Um, I heard earlier um, in the testimony the question that was regarding um, the lowest bidding and discussions around how we always have to pick the lowest bidder, which often doesn't um, mean that we're getting the greatest quality or the greatest service and the issue around change orders. My question is on this level and many others, I've seen during my time in office from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, and now we're into the Biden administration, as well as we've had issues now um, or victories rather where um, the Democrats are in the majority um, on the federal and state level. What can be done at this critical point right now on branches of government to change those types of policies and practices so that we're not just consistently um, giving way to the lowest bidders who um, unfortunately often don't look like our community, don't have, um, you know, we're pushing for this MWBE dynamic but if the lowest bidder is who's always going to win, that's not going to allow many of our MWBEs to win. So my question is for that one, is there any legislation in place? Is there any kind of movement? Because I feel like sometimes we get caught in the, well, this is the way it's always been. It's always been this way. So it's always going to be this way. Or when these changes in, in parties happen, do we rush to the boards to try and get some of these things to happen? And, if, and can you speak about other federal and state legislation that's on the boards right now that's looking to change some of the policies that have always kept us in this um, rat wheel of trying to change things? Uh, thank you so much, Majority Leader. And this is something that I think we've talked about plenty of times throughout the years that even mm -hmm. when NYCHA gets money, oftentimes residents say, the quality contractors is not, you know, someone that um, people feel good about and the work, even when it gets done, you know, oftentimes leaves people uh, thinking it probably could have been done better. Um, the way to do it better is by changing this uh, procurement system. And yes, we do have legislation in Albany that would allow us to go with, rather than lowest responsive bidder, go with best value. That means the company that, um, comes with the best possible offer that could get the work done in a reasonable amount of time, we would be allowed to, to make the argument that that's the contract that we should go to. In addition, um, in that legislation, we also have MWB Eagles because there is no reason why you can't get the best contractors and also make sure that you are also getting uh, contractors from within the community with strong MWB Eagles. Those things are not opposite. They should be both, you know, the goal of, you know, any agency, um, especially NYCHA. So Senate Bill 6999. Um, I talk about this so much that I know it off the top of my head, um, mm -hmm. has those provisions in it. Um, and, you know, it's something that we're pushing um, as well. We've also talked to the sponsors about, because that's a, a massive 40 page bill, talking about just taking those things out of that bill and making it separate just on, you know, procurement as well. We're happy either way, but we need to, you know, kind of get our arms, to, you know, that are tied behind our backs right now untying the, the, you know, untying them and, and, and letting us get the best contractors. In addition, on the federal lever, level, we've been talking- M Mr. To Honan, let me just stop you right there. That sounds great, but why isn't that bill able to pass tomorrow? Like what's holding up something as common sense as something like this? Who, I mean, I, I don't want to say me... name names, but I mean, <laughs> who's holding this up so we can get it through? I'm sorry, Chair Sam Empress Samuel. I just want you to jump. I want to jump in there real quick. Can you say what the name of the bill is and who the sponsors are? So sure. That we real yep. It, it okay. is the uh, Public Housing Trust Bill. Um, and the sponsor in the Senate is Senator Kavanaugh. The sponsor in the Assembly is Assembly Member Simbowitz. It is, as I said, it is a very, part of a very large uh, piece of legislation that basically changes the way we we look and how public housing is funded you know in new york city um so also too i know that albany has been very slow over the years to change procurement rules it took probably a decade to get design built 
Um, it's something that doesn't, you know, doesn't happen easy, um, but it's something that we're going to continue to um, bring up to, um, we have a new administration in place. We've been having conversations with them. We've been telling them that this is, you know, really something without short of giving us money. This is something that, you know, Albany can do um, to really, really help us get quality work. Um, let, in me addition just, let me just say this, Brian, and please remember your thought. This is the type of bill and discussion that needs to be that our our constituents, our residents in public housing need to be aware of so that they can push this forward. We have a, a very interesting, what is it, eight months coming up, and there are going to be a lot of people meeting with those constituents. We need for them to be articulate in what they're advocating for and what they're asking for, and they need to be educated about this so that they are asking the right questions and pushing the right agenda for something as important as this. Um, we need to be more connected with our brothers and sisters in Albany in pushing this forward and getting this information out to the residents. So I'll please continue. Sure, sure, and and and, and I agree with you totally. And in any Time work that we, can, that we can do together on this, we'd be, we'd be happy to do that. Um, and just one last thing to that, one want, want to say is your former colleague, um, um, Congressman Torres, too, on the federal level, um, has been working with us to see if we can get a bill nationally to make sure that not only is this something that we can do for NYCHA, but we can do for public housing authorities throughout the country as well. Can you talk to us a little bit? I'm sorry. Can you talk to us just to briefly summarize what um, I love to say that Congress member Richie mm -hmm. Torres um, what his bill is, is specifically calling for. Yes, I think his, his bill calls for a more streamlined approach um, for uh, procurement and also for allowing public housing authorities to get the best contractors, all, you know, that are, are possible, nice. not just going with the lowest responsive bidder. Um, again, when you get the lowest, you often get what you pay for, and you often get change orders that cause frustration on to everyone. It causes frustration, especially to the residents, but it causes frustration to the authority as well. And it's something that nobody, you know, nobody likes to see, and uh, and, it, and I think it, it it erodes trust. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the extra time, Chair Ambry Samuel. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to just add that a lot of times we see this. Um, on a state level and on a federal level where we have a bill where certain components of the bill makes a lot of sense. But in order for you know, everyone to be satisfied, um, it'll include things that not everybody is um, on board with. And so this particular public trust bill is something that they've had a, a, a public hearing on. Um, I wanna say it was last year, December, it could have been two mm -hmm. Well, yep, it was last December. Yes. Last year, December, and um, on the state level. And a lot of the state legislators spoke on their opinion about the bill and um, other even city representatives. And the residents are very keyed in to what the language of the bill states because there's been a, a, a public trust conversation tour <laughs> to all the night of development. And the resident leaders have been very open and vocal about their opinion. And again, there are some pieces, components to the bill that, that's dynamic and there's things that we actually advocated for. Um, but again, we have to continue having conversations with the future of public housing um, and what is going to happen with the future of public housing and the opportunities for residents to you know, be owners and have more of a, you know, a stake and an opinion and input and feedback. And so um, it's a very interesting bill and complicated at the same time. <laughs> That's it for me. I mean, I have more questions, but I know that Council Basala Monka hand is raised. Council Member Salamanca. Uh, and also, just, excuse me. Uh, also, just a reminder to other members who are present if you have questions, to also use the Zoom raise hand function, and we'll call on you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, um, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, on this such an important hearing, um, especially on utilities and preparing for the winter. Um, uh, the chairwoman 
Councilman Ayala and myself, we have the third largest nitro portfolio in the city of New York. And one of the, when I go around and I speak to my constituents uh, at Jackson houses, at Merrill's houses, at Stedman's Hewitt Consolidated, it's always the same issue when winter's coming. Am I going to have hot water? Is my boiler is going to be working? Am I going to have heat? Or am I going to be sleeping with a coat this winter? So my question to you, um, um, you guys at NYCHA, um, I'm going to make about six years now in March as a council member. And for up to six years, every year, my NYCHA developments at the same locations are having the same issues. What's going to be so different this winter? Sure. Council member, um, it's me now. I'll start um, and then I'll see if Javier wants to um, add anything. Um, again, I, I think, you know, as we, um, as I testified and as we try to respond to questions, um, I think we're much better, better prepared this year than we have been in previous years. Um, a lot of effort went into preparing for this heat season. Um, we've we've uh, made a number of significant investments. Um, I would love to, to um, spend some time with you and just talk about your developments um, and we can go Yeah, over. so I have three minutes. We can do that now. We have three minutes and I would like to do that on the record. Well, what's going to happen when Stevens U is consolidated? Because for the last five and a half years I've been in office, their boilers does not work in the winter and they have no hot water. Javier, I'm sorry, do you have information on that particular development? No, I, I don't have the details on that particular development. Um, yeah. No, I don't. I don't. You can't, this I don't is know. the problem. You're always unprepared when it comes to these hearings. You know we're going to well, ask you these questions. Well, sir, um, with all due respect, sir, we, we, we don't have a, the, a, the plan for every single development in front of us um, at this point in time. We can certainly share with you um, the plan for each of your developments, um, but we don't have it prepared for this hearing to talk about every single development and the investments that we've made or are planning to make. Right? But I can assure you that, that a lot of effort um, has gone into uh, preparing for this heat season, more so than even in previous years. Council uh, Member Salamanca, can you, can you name those three again? Uh, there are Stebbins, Hewitt Consolidated, Jackson Houses, and Melrose Houses. So those three during this hearing right now, we only asking for three. Yes, the, gonna... It's in the same line. It's in the same line of questions, you know, that I had before. What what were the issues with the developments from the previous heating season, and knowing that you have all these, you know, amazing statistics, what's happening now? Um, because that's sure. that kind and of we, a little bit of what you know. And we, we will do our best to get answers to those um, specific developments before the end of the hearing. Um, if not, we will certainly send you something in writing. Um, that lining the plan for these particular developments. Right, but we'll do right. our best to try to get the information before the end of the hearing. What's your policy on winterizing the boilers? I'm sorry, so, uh, winterizing boilers? The boilers. Every year, you know, like when if someone owns a home, you get someone in to come and check your boiler, check your pipes, to ensure that they're working. What is your policy to doing this at Nature Developments? Sure, and, and I, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to definitely hand off to Javier. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, um, we actually started our preparation for this heat season last February. Um, we took advantage of some of the warmer uh, days, and we started doing our um, inspections. Um, Javier will talk more specifically about that. Um, I, I do want to again thank the the Federal Monitor uh, because they really have been tremendous partners. In, in helping us prepare for this heat season. Um, and they have staff that are out there um, every day, um, along with our staff, doing inspections of the heating plants, finding um, issues, sending us reports and pictures. Uh, it really has been a tremendous value. So I do want to thank them publicly for that. Um, Javier, if you could please speak to the council member um, about the preparedness and what you do. So uh, the preparedness involves our uh, annual uh, overhaul and inspection process that we perform on the on the boilers. And what we do is we take them apart, open them up, uh, clean them internally and externally, lubricate them and replace the worn parts and make any follow-up repairs that are required on that piece of equipment. Um, then Time is inspired. 
sorry, once the staff is done with that process, the supervisor comes out, inspects that work to do a sort of like a QA inspection on it and point out any other areas that require additional follow-up. The additional follow-up can be a piece of pipe that may need to be replaced, uh, an equalizer line that, that uh, houses the water uh, leveling devices on the boiler, or it could be boiler welding welding on that uh, boiler that needs to be done for which we have contractors to uh, do. Um, and then once that follow-up is done, the boiler is put back online, it gets hydrostatically tested, and uh, a, a team of burner mechanics comes out and does a combustion analysis on our larger boilers to ensure that it's running efficiently, and then it's put back online. Manager Chair, may I ask a, a quick follow-up question? Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, um, Javier. Uh, so my question sure. is, this, this maintenance work is performed to every boiler at every NYCHA development in the city of New York? Yes, yes it is. Once a year, once a year, this is done? Once a year, yes. And this is documented. I, we can sit down one day and, and, and I can go visit and you can, you, can, you can show me with documentation that every boiler in the city of New York once a year gets maintenance. We, we have a PM uh, work order that the staff builds on. All right. Um, and then my last question is how many boilers, how many boilers do we have in, the, in, 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 in total for all NYCHA developments? Hold on. Let me just give me one minute. Bear with me, okay? Well, Javier is looking for that, Councilmember. I do have an update on at least one of the three developments that you mentioned, Jackson, right? That is in phase one of the state funded. Um, projects it's in design it's design build um, so we'll get back to you with a, a, a more solid date um, when we expect completion but that one is funded and it is in a pipeline hi hello can you hear me yes yes i want to answer your question so um conventional boilers which are the larger boilers we have 600 i'm sorry 710 um and the smaller package boilers are we have 642 and i'm sorry my math was a little bit off just give me one minute total of 1352 boilers okay all right all right well i um i, I look i look forward to the follow-up and the, um, the follow-up on the questions that i had regarding my three nitro developments that every year um suffer from having access to hot water and heat during the winter seasons. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me. Real quick, um, Councilman Zalamanca, you're okay with any follow-up at all with the Jackson, that they're in a design build process or you? I mean, they, it, he, can, he can tell me he's on a pipeline. We all know what the pipeline means in NYCHA. You know, it, it's probably not going to occur for, you know, for some time, but I'll, I'll let them to, I'll, I'll allow them to follow up properly. Right, and if, I, if I can add too, we just took a look at last year's um, uh, heat outages. Now for Stebbins, uh, Stebbins Hewitt, there were two unplanned heat outages um, lasting 10 hours. That was last heat season. Melrose had two unplanned heat outages restored within 5.8 hours. And Jackson, we did not have any unplanned heat outages last year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so, so, um... I know you're done, Salamak, I understand that. But just real quick, um, Vito, because those are the issues that we have in the district, across the district, and I keep hearing it over and over and over. It may not be the development, but it's those individual apartments. Could it be an issue where um, there's a problem with like a piping and getting to an individual apartment? Because I hear from the same residents every year and it's been an ongoing issue and, and Brian knows my issue in Brownsville houses with those same individual unique apartments yeah no chair um absolutely there could be um issues within the apartment i mean what we're talking about really here is um we're replacing the heating plants uh, and what we need to kind of focus on um and, and have been focused on is all the ancillary parts to the system right the distribution system in particular right um and so yes the heating plant new heating plants are fantastic uh, but we need to um, we kind of focus on on how do we distribute the heat from the heating plant to the apartment, 
And that's going to require major capital um, uh, investment. Uh, it means going into every apartment, um, replacing um, steam lines. Right? Uh, so it's a major undertaking. Um, I, you know, going back to the integrated IVR system, that has really helped us identify the issues that you're talking about, like very specific to and unique to apartments. Right? Um, oftentimes, it's nothing more than replacing a radiator valve um, or a steam valve, right? um, which, which has helped us tremendously. Uh, but again, the reality of it is, is that we need um, what, in excess of $70 billion, right? We need to actually go in and replace um, the infrastructure of our buildings, uh, the distribution point from the heating plant to the delivery in the apartment. Um, you so said 70, seven zero? 70, 70 billion, I think is, Ryan, correct me if I'm How wrong. How do we go from, we went from 38 billion, now we have 70 billion already? No, the... Um, we're still at forty, but the uh, the national number, yeah, the national oh. number is seventy billion. Yeah, we need we need more. <laughs> we need a lot of money. <laughs> peter has got big plans. He's got <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I of course I do. I would love to see yeah. all of our systems replaced. So true. Um, yep. Chair, Chair, while I have the opportunity, um, I, I I did tell you that I would get back to you on a question that you asked me. I do have the information now. Um, so uh, it had to do with the MyNYCHA app. Yes. Uh, I could give you the, some quick numbers. Um, so currently we have 111,855 distinct users, right, representing 92,756 unique apartments. Right? And that's uh, an increase over the same time last year. Last year at the same time, we had 102,820 users. Right. Um, and they represented 86,820 uh, unique apartments. So we're doing much better. Um, we're getting more residents to sign up for MyNYCHA app. Uh, we've made a number of systems upgrades to MyNYCHA app. It does provide for real-time um, updates on, on issues. Um, so we encourage all of our residents. Um, it's fantastic that we're up to almost 112,000. We'd like to see all of our residents um, sign up for MyNYCHA app. So the more that we can all do to encourage folks to do that, uh, it's it's been a, it's a fantastic tool. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that information. So go, moving on to third-party vendors. During the February 6, 2018 hearing, um, property management, the chief of staff of property management, Kathy Pennington at the time stated that the transfer of the transfer of 69 developments to a third party management system would enable NYCHA staff to increase focus on the remaining boilers in the portfolio. So today, how many boiler rooms are managed by a third party vendor? Javier? In number and percentages. Sure. Right now it's um, uh, 53 in, in, in total that are managed. Um, and we have two third party contractors. First one is National Grid. They have um, 30 boiler rooms. And the second one is Georgia's Hall. They have 20, 23. That's as of today, Chair. Uh, we mm -hmm. are looking uh, to see if, if we gain efficiency um, by assigning some additional heating plants to those two vendors. But that's where we stand as of today. Okay, and that's what percentage of your buildings, of your rooms? Um, wow, I would have to do this quick math somehow. Okay. Yeah. And while Javier right. does that, I think it's important to note too that even though we did move these um, heating plants over to third party, uh, conversely, we also increased our headcount. Right? So it's not as if we reduced our uh, in house um, staffing levels we've actually increased our in-house staffing levels. So we reallocated those staff to um, other developments, uh, but we also increased our staffing. Okay. Javier, Javier you've got the percentages? It's, um, that's going to take a from that. Um, looking at last heat season, how many heat and hot water orders and outages were in developments that were under a third party management system? Um, very good question. Overall, um, they had a total, now this is a total heat work order. 
total amount of uh, work orders was 51,265. That's uh, both heat and hot water. <clears throat> 36,948 were for heat and 14,317 were for hot water. Okay. And can you explain how does NYCHA track the performance of the third party vendor? And how do we, you compare we, that, like the boiler rooms managed by the third party to the boiler rooms that are managed by NYCHA? So the, the, the way we track, let's start with the way we track it first. We, we track it the same way we track ours. Maximo and, and uh, the two key performance indicators that I mentioned earlier, Maximo and the, and the CHAS along. Um, these developments are subject to that as well. Residents can make work orders just like they can at any other development. So naturally, if we see a spike in the work orders at any of these sites, then we're going to ask the vendor what's going on. And if we see a CHAS alarm, they also the vendors being they, they also get the chat along and, and they know to respond to those chat alarms. When we don't see a response, we, we communicate with those vendors uh, directly. So we, we, we track their performance the same way we track. How long is the wait time between like looking to see the response and then saying, okay, let's just step in? Well, we, 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 we look for something within the hour from, oh. from that. And if we do see a spike in the work orders to my, to my heat test, as I said before, the heat test operates 24 hours a day. Okay. And so when we do see the spike, we, we communicate with them right away. Um, it's an, also important to point out that uh, during the normal course of the day, when we see a spike, we'll communicate with property management first to confirm that there's, a, that there's, a, that there's an issue. After hours, then we're communicating directly with the third party vendors and we're using our roving teams to, uh, to, to also confirm that there is a problem at those sites. Okay. So, um, when we communicate with the uh, development staff during the normal course of the day, that's 8 to, to, to 4.30, they find an issue, we, we require that vendor to be there within that hour. And normally they are, because they're, they're either within the area or, or within that boiler room. Okay, okay, okay. So, when someone shows up to the apartment to do a check. Can you just explain what that looks like? So is it a, a member of the third party vendor team and a member of your team? What, what does that look like? So the way the way that works, um, it's property management staff that um, visit the apartment. The third party vendor does not visit the apartment. They manage and maintain the equipment in the basement and in the boiler room. Got it. Um, but let me let me just point out that before we went into the third party agreement with the contractor and, and providing them with the, uh, the portfolio that they have, we ensured that the development staff was trained on what to look for when they go into an apartment and, and inspect a uh, uh, working off of a work order that was generated by the, uh, the resident, a heat complaint in this case. Trained them on, on what to look for and, and how to uh, correct any condition that's related to the in-unit equipment. And once that's done, if the problem does not um, uh, correct or the problem is bigger than just the apartment, then the vendor gets involved. And at that point, if there's a service disruption that's related to the equipment, then we create the, the uh, service disruption outage work order. Okay. Okay. So, um, in in that that uh, that infamous question about the the log books in the boiler room, <laughs> um, can you just speak a little bit to who like what's happening now with those the log books in the boiler room? Who's writing in the log books? And um, and does NYCHA have plans to replace the boiler log books with the handheld devices technology? Modern technology. So, so let, let's let's get over here. Like three three questions in, in, in that one uh, statement. So we'll, we'll start with who who uh, writes in the log. Anyone that visits the boiler room writes in the log. Primarily the the uh, boiler operator. That's the individual that's in the plant that's there to 
perform the safety checks and all the blow downs that must be recorded in that uh, boiler room uh, law, right? And then your, your second part of your question is um, related to whether or not we're gonna move away from the logbook. Is that right? Did I understand that right? Yes, but going back to the logbook too, just um, like when we're talking about in the context of a third party vendor and who's doing mm -hmm. what, just trying to get a sense of, um, so the information is given to the property management staff or the person that's working for like a NYCHA employee. Is that the only person that's touching the logbook or? Well, with the third party uh, vendor, their, their staff, their boiler operators are the ones that are writing in the logbook. And, oh. and as I said before, anyone that visits that boiler room for whatever reason, whether they're just performing a, a, a visual inspection or, or checking up on, on, on an employee that might be working in the boiler room also has to record the reason for them being in that in that boiler room in the logbook as well. Okay. Chair, when I go to a boiler room, the staff <laughs> asks me to sign the logbook as well. Right? And, and the book is required um, it, by both local as well as state regulation. <laughs> Okay. 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 I was just, I was just wondering, you know, just as you were talking, remembering that things right. that miss, you know, the, the data and information that's being put into the log book and transcribing that into like the maximal system or, you know, if there's just, just conversations around that. Sure. Well, a lot of the information resides in both places. So obviously if it's really related to a repair, um, then it's in maximal as well. But again, the logbooks are required. Um, and we just confirmed again um, that at both the local as well as the state level, um, they they are still required to actually have a bound book in the in the, in the <laughs> boiler room. <laughs> okay, um, and I just got a note here too that. I'm sorry, that was um, background. Though. Going back to the conversation around the individual apartments and the possibility of just needing to replace a valve or, you know, just trying to figure out uh, why those individual apartments may not have heat and hot water. Um, if you look at Fiorentino, Fiorentino as an example, um, Fiorentino received new boilers, right? Right. But no valves in the apartments. And because the windows are old and lack insulation, the fact that they have a new boiler doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's, it's good, it's needed, but it may not help the individual um, residents and the individual apartments actually feel the new boilers because of all those other issues in the in their apartments. Um, and, and so that goes, I guess, back to what you were all saying around, you have the boilers, but you have all these other issues related to it. And I just wanted to point out Fiorentino as one of those. And the fact that Fiorentino is listed as one of the developments uh, for direct funding and to address those issues, um, it's sure. not just well, this is everything else. Sure. So we'll we'll look at this as a, um, both the windows as well as the, uh, the, the valves and the apartments. And we'll get back to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. But anything like just your level of expertise and experience to speak to Florentino? I mean, not to do any kind of investigative research, but just your experiences and to say, okay, well, if we had this, you know, the mm -hmm. families, they would have no complaints. Thank you, Florentino's, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Nito, uh, no, 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 uh, no, Florentino, I think, as you know, council members are very high needs development, uh, the capital needs are very high. And that, that is why um, we are looking to transfer it over to PACT. Um, it um, you know, has issues from the roof to the windows to, you know, the uh, if you see there's scaffolding, so there are brick issues there, um, as well as the heating system. Um, it's just a, it's a lot, it's a small development with a lot of needs. Okay, because you see, so if you have this major invest again, I, the, so the boilers are needed, right? That major investment is needed, um, but just trying to figure out what else, so that the family inside that unit or that development could feel 
um, this massive investment in this building. And so is there a need to have, um, if, you, if you've replaced the boilers, for there to be a weatherization contract at the same time, because you know that that would address that one concern? I think, that, I think this is the frustra frustration over the way we've looked at capital um, because the way we get money, right? So we get money to replace like one thing, we get money to replace boilers, or we get money to replace roofs, or we get money to replace, you know, do brickwork. Um, but really what is needed is to comprehensively take care of the issues at a development. Uh, in order for the folks in Ferentino to say, like, we feel confident that you're not going to have issues is by taking care of all of those things, right? And so when we're looking at the federal money that we possibly could be getting, we're not going to be looking at, you know, doing one component at a time. We're going to be looking at, you know, addressing all of those, all those issues, and then we can feel confident that, you know, saying that, yes, when we get a new boiler, you're also going to have new windows. And you're also going to have a, a roof that is, you know, in good shape. Um, and so the building's going to hold the heat in. Um, and you're not going to have, you know, the new boiler acting well, um, but it's going out the window, literally. Yes. Which goes back to our big need. <laughs> yes, it's all, all roads lead to all roads. <laughs> yeah. OK, all right. Um... Thank you. you know, I'd like to have like a, an example. Um, we have been joined by Council Member Gibson. Um, so moving into gas outages. <clears throat> How many gas outages are currently active? I'll mention right now. As of today? As of today. We have 61 gas outages. Um, that are impacting we have 61 gas outages impacting 2,454 apartments. Now when I say gas outage chair, um, it could either be, um, again, a, an apartment, uh, in one case, uh, a line of apartments, a building. Um, and I don't believe we have any full developments, uh, but we do have buildings uh, that the entire building is currently experiencing a gas outage. And um, when you say 61 outages, across how many developments is that? Can you give me that, Michael? How many developments? Um, yeah, all right, well, we'll we're getting okay. that number for you right now. Okay. Um, and what is the, so I know there are different types of gas outages. So what is the main cause of gas outages right now? What's the main cause? Sure, and I will start and I will ask uh, Cal Bruno to jump in um, and assist here. Um, I mean, basically, um, Chair, what we're looking at, it's, it's a gas leak <clears throat> um, that's been reported either to us, uh, to the utility company, or to the fire department. Um, and, and because of the age of our buildings, and most of our gas pipes are, are still the original gas pipes, um, it's, it's um, impossible to isolate where the leak is with the shutoff valve. Um, so it would require then a, a shutoff of the entire building. Um, if there is a valve um, for a riser, then we're able to isolate it to a line of apartments. Right? Um, and then also there's the local law um, 152 um, that was passed that requires all owners to do inspections of their gas lines every four years. And um, a number of our current outages are related to local law 152 inspections, which are proactive inspections. Right? Um, so we actually have a, a contractor that performs these inspections for us. Um, if they detect a, a gas leak, um, then we have a, a period of time to, uh, to respond to. Um, or if we can't um, isolate the leak, then we have to do a shutdown. So right now of the um, total number of gas outages, um, 10 of those are due to local law 152 inspections. 
And when you have those, the, the ones related to the local law inspections, um, what's the time frame of there being a gas outage? If there's nothing, um, if there are no flags um, from that outage, or you know that was that would require you to trigger something else. Um, yeah, sure. Cal, do you want to speak um, to the chair's question about the? Um... And just oh. to a picture. Do the inspections sure. usually lead to? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, Cal could give you the details. And, and Chair, I'm sorry, before uh, Cal jumps in, um, you asked the number of developments impacted. There are 51 developments um, that currently have uh, gas outages. So the 61 outages represent 51 developments? Correct. Okay. Sure. So it's to it in response to your question, so as, as we're doing a local law uh, 152 inspections and there's uh, any evidence of a leak, whether it's smell uh, or, or something that leads us to testing it right away, we immediately shut down for safety purposes, right? So any, any leak at all, whether it's a single riser, an apartment and or building gets shut down. So the inspections, this proactive approach has helped us really look at of the conditions that are not leaking that allow us to make other kind of repairs to prevent leaks. But we've experienced 10 active leaks that we've shut down and we're you know, treated once it's shut down like any other gas leak because it's gas and because of the utmost attention it gets because of safety, you know, we immediately shut down, we, we, we isolate the line and then we go through a series of steps uh, to start to test and repair and replace the pipes, and then we test them once again before we restore the gas. Okay, so purposes of the residents being able to, under, and also my colleagues, um, understanding the, the, the difference in how um, gas can be restored, can you just go through um, just a timeline? Because some restorations will take six months, and some can be um, 90 days or or three weeks. So can you explain what happens? Yeah, I'm gonna just go through like the series of steps, pretty much the way it happens for all gas house. And then if there's any specific questions, you know, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Basically it starts with a uh, smell of gas is reported and it gets investigated. So then either the gas line or the entire building if necessary is shut down. Um, scope, a scope of work is created by our plumbing supervisors and they're sent to what we have a licensed master plumber that handles an, all, all the oversight and all the filing related to any, any gas work. The licensed master plumber prepares an asbestos scope of work and gives it to our asbestos investigation unit. Our asbestos okay, investigation- right timelines. Yep. Mm -hmm. So timelines, smell gas, triggers this inspection. Um, what's the timeline between the the smell of the gas and then the inspector coming out to do the research. Right. So any any work order or any report of smell gas is considered an emergency. We have supervisors, maintenance workers at every development. Those folks go out immediately to investigate immediately. Right. And once they confirm it's a leak and they isolate the line line on the spot, they either shut down the valve if it's available to that riser that's leaking. And if not, they'll shut down the whole building. They immediately isolate the line and then they uh, call our supervisor of plumbers to come and isolate it even better. They either separate it or lock it down to make sure that nothing can happen until testing and repairs are made. Okay. That's one bit, if I can, I think to your question too. Um, so for 2021, um, we've been averaging 96 days to restore gas service um, from the time of an outage. Uh, that's down from last year where the average was 116 days. Uh, but as Cal's, you know, talking about, it's a very- oh, that, so, so, and that's, so, so Cal was just, so he stopped at the inspection part, right? And then was gonna go into- um, Or he could process. go through the whole process. Yeah, so I wanted to get that understanding um, because when you just said average time, 96 days, again, sometimes it'll be three months, sometimes it'll be six months, right? And then we have residents that's, that's you know, complaining about a little more 
And so, um, sure. So, like and, and so right now, sense, but I'm just trying to get a sense of what's the difference. Right. And if I can, before Cal goes back to the process of the 61 that we have right now, only two of them are over six months. Um, and both of them have passed DOB inspection. So we hope to have the services restored um, you know, in a few days. Right. Um, so those are the outliers. That's not the norm. Okay. Right. On average, on average, it's about three months. Right. But Cal, I'm sorry, please go back to the process. Yeah. And, and some of the factors that affect the time it takes to restore is of course the size of the building, right? So how many residents live there? The more, the bigger the building, the more pipe you have to replace, the more residents you have to access to get into apartments. It's also the asbestos investigation that gets performed. Sometimes you have to actually do abatement. So that adds another step. You have to do the abatement before you can start replacing the pipes. Um, so definitely the size of the uh, building and number of residents that live there the asbestos investigation. And then sometimes it's really the configuration of the pipe uh, itself could add additional time in order to replace it. Okay. So for okay. purposes of use this as an example. I'm sorry? Let's talk about, I was gonna say this guy. I was gonna say um, Park. What's, what's the one, um, Brian? 1636 Park Place? Is it the... <laughs> I'm sorry, which one are you? I think it's, um, is that Park Rock? Park Rock is, yes, Park Rock, yeah. I think it's 1634 Park Place. Yeah. Park Rock, I don't see any current gas out here. Is it Lakes, Lakes, Lakes and Hughes? Lakes and Hughes had a very long outage too. Um, one one second, let me, let me just look, one second. Again, right now, the oldest outage that we have um, is impacting three apartments at, at uh, Brook Ellen. And, and again, that past inspection. Um, so we do expect that that should be restored um, shortly. That's the oldest gas outage that we have. And, and again, three, three apartments are, are involved there. Yeah, Chair, I, I just want to go to Cal, what Cal described to Crown Heights. Um, Crown Heights. Uh, Crown Heights. Okay. Uh, right. yeah. It mm -hmm. requires that we get into every apartment multiple times. Um, so there's a lot of coordination uh, that needs to happen with our residents. And we work closely with our TA leadership. Um, we work closely, closely with property management because, again, it does really require um, multiple um, access. Right. I'm sorry, Crown Heights. The only gas out that I see right now. Crown Heights, 1646 Park Place. Right, it's one building, 25 apartments. And the gas outage was reported on September 7th. Right, there was a broken gas valve in an apartment that resulted in the gas outage. And it is currently assigned to a vendor. I, I can get you more details on, on when we expect to have it. Services. Okay, so um, you you'll get back to me on the details, but I just so can you un, can you just explain um, that process? So they called September seventh. There was a gas outage. I know the apartment. Um, there yeah. was a, an issue. She actually called the fire department. Someone came in. They closed right. it, and so just and they had to shut down the entire line, right? And it so, looks like, so and, yeah, yes, go ahead, Cal. Yeah, I was going to say the process in in general, and it would apply there too, but we could provide the specifics if, you know, given a little time, is that once we shut, we make the line safe by shutting it down and isolating it. Then we, we have to, uh, we work with our asbestos unit to go out and do an asbestos investigation. If there's any abatement that's needed, they perform the abatement and then let us know everything's clear to do physical work uh, to the gas line. If no abatement is needed, they, they provide us that information and then we, we file uh, the work with the Department of Buildings. Uh, we request a permit. That usually happens immediately. That, that's never a slowdown. Once we get the permit, we can physically do the work, right? We've gotten clearance that there's no asbestos that we're gonna impact. Uh, we've gotten the Department of Buildings permit. Now we start the physical work. So now we access the, the, the units, we, you know, we put out notices, we 
uh, conduct meetings to make everyone aware of the work that we want to do. And we actually physically replace the line, the gas line in each, in each unit. Um, in doing so, we obviously disconnect the stoves uh, to start, and then we put a whole new line in. And once that line has been completed, um, what we do then is we pretest to make sure that that line that we just installed, that it, it's holding pressure, there's no leak. Once we're satisfied with, with, with that pretest, we then uh, we work with the Department of Buildings and they come out and they do a DOB inspection. Upon passing their inspection, they give us authorization to turn on the gas. We then work with the utility company. So how long out. does it take to get the DOB to come and inspect from the from just an average time frame? Um, yeah, I mean, DOB, um, they're out there. I mean, yeah, I mean, we've been, we've had no delays at all. Okay. <clears throat> the Bill's yeah, department has that's been days. fantastic partners. That's days. Yeah, that that's a matter of days. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so, at so best, work, at best. Yeah. That, then we work with the utility company. They come out. They do uh, their own inspection. Uh, they and then once once everything's passed with the uh, utility department inspections, they actually turn the gas on, and then our plumbers reconnect the stoves. Uh, and at that so point, was it the utility the company? I'm sorry. Okay, so there it is. Is it the the utility company? Is that the time frame that's taking so long? Well, I mean, it, it varies because every different component takes a number of days. There are several tests that are done. So I wouldn't say it's always one particular area. It, again, it, it depends on the size of the building. It depends on the complexity uh, and configuration of the piping. Um, and it also depends, obviously, on your ability to get in and do se se you know, several different things in the residence apartments. You, you're getting in to disconnect the stove. You're getting in to re run new piping. You're getting in to do the pretest at times. And then you're getting in with the utility company because they like to spot check some of the apartments. And then finally, you're getting in again uh, to reconnect the stoves. So we really require the resident to be home you know, three, four times during this process. And so that all that takes time. Uh, not, not that I want to say, you know, none of this is something that the resident can help, but it just takes time. And that's what adds to the days, you know, and, and going back to configuration, when you're doing a whole buildings, there's times that you know pipes run through basements and run through different rooms. So sometimes that adds a little bit of time because you're mm -hmm. changing all the piping. Okay, I was um, the reason why I mentioned um, Crown Heights is because it's a four-story walk-up old tenement building. So mm -hmm. it's not like a massive development like Langston Hughes that Brian mentioned um, a few minutes ago. That's twenty-something stories. You know, um, so I just was trying to get an understanding of, you know, we have the same time frame and you have a short walk up. That's a very small development, small building. Right. Units. So, so the physical work is less. Building. Right. So I'm sorry. So the physical work is less because you have to change less piping, obviously. Right. So that's that that's there's time savings there. But all the other steps, the pre-inspection, the DOB inspection, the inspection with the utility company. And all that, all that yeah. is still time consuming and all that happens regardless of the size. Right, and the asbestos investigation. And if there's yeah, it, it, asbestos needed to be abated, you got to include that. Also in some of our buildings, not, not a lot, a small, because of the configuration, some of the pipes sometimes are actually inside the wall. So they, they, it's called concealed, they concealed piping. What we like to do if we come across that is we actually core drill and uh, put the pipe in a new location to make it easier to inspect and to access. So we've also come across, although it's it's something that only happens very rarely, that the pipes are actually concealed in some of our older constructions, and we place them outside for you know to future access and reference and and inspections, and that also adds a, a, another step to the process. Okay, right. and 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 then the, so when I speak to National Grid like about Crown Heights. Um, I'm told that they're always ready to go in um, and do whatever it is that, that they need to do from their side, but it's DOE, I mean, it's DOB and um, NYCHA plumbers that are always the holdup. And so I'm just trying to get an understanding of yeah. you know, how to streamline and, and, you know, I don't know, put some policies in place to help with the, sure. the process. 
I mean, we'll certainly have that conversation with Nick, right? I mean, I was on a call with Connor Edison last week. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the same uh, issue with Connor Edison. Certainly, DOB is not a delay at all. Um, they've been fantastic. And in fact, the commissioner has even offered, uh, you know, for some of these turnouts uh, to come out on, on a day's notice uh, to meet oh. our plumbers out there. Um, you know, so they've, they've been great partners. Um, that grid, um, we'll have a conversation with them, similar to the conversation we had with Con Edison. Uh, okay. Any way so that we can. Let me know, what do, you, what do you think, just from your expertise and your just being in this field for so many years and hearing the concerns and the complaints, what, like, what are we doing wrong? Uh, Chair, with all, I, I think, um, you know, three months average, I mean, look, for the, for the resident, it's, it's three months too long. I, on average, that's about what we had. Look, like when I was at HPD, um, I remember dealing with uh, privately owned buildings that had gas outages that ex far exceeded the three months. Um, again, as Cal indicated, it's a very labor intensive process. I think we're doing well. Uh, I think we can certainly do better. Um, the good thing about when we're doing the gas free pipes um, is that we should not see, a, if there is, God forbid, a gas leak in any of those buildings in the future, Part of our scope of work is we're installing shutoff valves, right? So we can isolate where the leaks are. Um, you know, we don't have to shut down a complete building. So we're being smart about the work that we do um, in response to to a gas outage. Um, again, I'm going to go back to our big ask, the billions. You know, I would love to be able to say that that we have the funds to come in and and do a full gas repipe of every building, uh, because again, most of our buildings have the original piping in them. Uh, so that's like, if you ask me my wish list, uh, that's on my wish list. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm good. I'm done with, with... moving on. <laughs> Thank you so much about the gas. Moving quickly to uh, electrical outages. Uh, um, before we... Uh, excuse me, Chair. Uh, just before we move into this next set of questions, I just wanted to um, say a quick reminder to the members of the public that are waiting. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we will uh, um, we will turn to you for your testimony as soon as the questions with the administration have concluded. Thank you again. Okay. Electrical outages. How many electrical outages occurred in NYCHA in 2020? Electrical outages in 2020. I'm sorry, Chair. Chair. Oh, wait, you know what, before, before we go to the electrical outages, one last question, um, or just comment, you can comment on this. Um, what do you provide your residents when there is a gas outage? Oh, certainly. Uh, so historically, we've only given residents hot plates, um, which made no sense because you can't cook a meal on a hot plate. Uh, starting last April, uh, we started purchasing uh, slow cookers as well. Uh, and in fact, we've purchased over 10,000 slow cookers to date. Uh, and I want to thank one of our TA presidents who kind of gave us that idea. Uh, she, she did it um, for some of the residents when they experienced a gas outage. And I thought it was fantastic. Uh, so now we provide our residents with both uh, a hot plate as well as a slow cooker. So you can prepare a full meal. Uh, hot plates are generally delivered the same day or day after, um, again, depending on access. Um, and then the slow cookers uh, follow, uh, but we're providing both. We also provide residents with um, other services, our uh, family partnership and resident engagement, uh, do outreach. Uh, what we try to do is um, you know, if a resident um, receives Meals on Wheels, uh, we'll work with our partners at DEFTA to increase the uh, food delivery. If a resident qualifies but is not signed up, we encourage them to sign up. Uh, we also work with our partners at HRA uh, to increase allowances for those residents that are uh, might be receiving assistance from HRA. Uh, and we also provide a residents with a number of other uh, sources. Um, 
where they can, um, you know, food resources, pantries and the like. Um, so, so there's a lot of interaction um, uh, with our residents. And, and I think the slow cookers, again, I, I wanna thank one of our TA leaders. Uh, that was really a brilliant um, suggestion. Do you, have to we should have done. Do you have to request a slow cooker or? Is no, no, we, we offer every household a slow cooker. Yeah, you don't have to request it, we offer it. Okay, and I will say that not everyone um, receives a slow cooker and had no idea about the slow cooker. Because, Again, it's something that we just recently started. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I understand that. And that, yeah. I'm, I'm only saying that because, again, um, the Crown Heights development, I had to, I asked them what were they offered, um, I think like a couple of weeks ago. And um, and when I mentioned the slow cooker, uh, some of the residents were excited about that, hearing that information for the first time. So I understand it's, a, it's, it's new. Um, so, okay, moving on and just put in the next um, question, and this will be the, the end of my questioning. Um, if my, I don't think my colleagues have any other questions, um, but just putting into context, the electrical outages, just knowing that over the summer, um, you know, we had some serious electrical outages that were something due to the prevent, preventing a blackout and brownouts. Um, the utility companies would step in and turn down the wattage, the voltage. And so um, I just want to get a sense from NYCHA, uh, like just what are you doing? How are you preparing the communications that you have um, with Con Edison? And so I'm just starting out with how many elect electrical outages occurred in 2020? And you can also speak to 2021 this past um, summer season. Sure. So we're, we're pulling the numbers um, with respect to um, what we experienced this past summer. Um, as you mentioned, um, voltage reductions are, um, I guess, unfortunately necessary in order to save a grid uh, from a failure. Uh, it impacts not only NYCHA, but all properties. Uh, and primarily where it impacts us the most is uh, elevator service. Um, so when the voltage drops down to a certain level, our elevators um, don't operate. Uh, we had a really productive conversation with the vice president um, for emergency management at Con Edison. Um, and that was just the beginning. I mean, we're continuing to have dialogue with Con Edison on how we can improve lines of communication. Um, I would love for them to be able to give us uh, sufficient notice before a voltage reduction so we can one alert our residents to the potential uh, that there will be disruption of service and then also too for us to safely bring our elevators out of service um, and so this way they're not uh, they don't go out of service when the voltage reduction um, um, is implemented uh, that's going to take some time um, they're they're committed to working with us um, i don't know how much advance notice we'll be able to receive uh, but we do get a lot of communication also through the New York City uh, Emergency Management uh, Department. Uh, they've been great partners as well. Uh, but we need we need to uh, to do better at getting that information to us um, from the utility companies from Con Edison. Um, you know, like I said, the the, the vice president for uh, emergency management is committed to working with us, uh, and we'll continue to work with that. As we replace our elevators, um, I think it's encouraging. Um, as we do replace our elevators, the newer um, elevators uh, do have a battery um, system, battery backup that will allow for when there's a voltage reduction um, for the elevator to at least safely go down to the first floor. Right? Um, but and that's part of um, obviously the replacement, the complete upgrade of an elevator. Um, most of our, a lot of our, about 45% of our elevators are past their life expectancy. But as we start to replace elevators, uh, we're using the newer technology that will account for some of these uh, issues. What's the percentage of, as we talk about elevator outages um, and electrical outages, what's the percentage of elevator outages being due to the decrease in the voltage as opposed to um, just actual normal, just the issues with the elevator itself. Yeah, Chair, that I, I know I don't have that information in front of me, but we can certainly get back to you with that. All right, that's a great question. Um, and when you mentioned the, um, like the backup battery, 
and being able to at least go down to the first floor, is it the elevator returning to the first floor because it's it's stuck because of the decrease in the voltage? Or are you saying the backup um, battery that will allow for the elevator to function period, go up and down or just down? Yeah, no, no. So the backup battery is really only designed to allow the elevator to go down to the first floor safely, and then it shuts down. Okay. Right? But again, what it avoids are uh, trapping any individual um, in an elevator between floors, right? Um, and and then it, it takes the ele elevator out of service in a way that's much more controlled than just um, the way the older devices are, where it just shuts down completely. Right. Restoration is a lengthy process when that happens. And um, just going back to your conversations with the utility companies as it relates to electrical outages, um, have there been conversations around the possibility of when they do decide to decrease the voltage in a certain community or area, um, what would that look like for the nitro development in that same community where the entire community is, the voltage is being decreased? Um, is there like a plan or conversation around possibly, um, you know, pressing a lever where, you know, it excludes the nitro developments? Is the yeah, un un unfortunately, uh, and that's a conversation that we might want to have with Con Edison, uh, but that was not, um, that didn't seem like to be possible. You know, I would love to be able to say that nitro would be excluded from any impacts of the voltage reductions um, or power um, outages, but I don't believe that that's possible. I, again, I think just advanced uh, communication, uh, even if they, um, and, and I know that oftentimes uh, they don't have a lot of notice prior to a voltage reduction, but as you know, if they can give us notice uh, in advance, that would be a tremendous value. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, I am done with my line of questions. Um, I would definitely say that, um, you know, I, I look forward to being able to hear what's happening with not just your conversations, your ongoing conversations with Conrad as it relates to um, outages and preventing those outages so elevators can work properly, um, but also any um, updated conversations with National Grid and DOB and everyone else um, so that we can expedite the process of getting gas outages restored um, in less than three months um, because we already know when we hit the holidays, we hear it, especially around Thanksgiving and, and, um, and Christmas. Um, and also too, as we started out this entire conversation related to the preparedness for um, the winter season and having adequate heat and hot water for the residents, um, I appreciate um, where you are right now compared to where you were three and four years ago um, and look forward to your ongoing conversations with the federal monitor to make sure that all residents receive the proper services um, that they deserve. Um, and so with that, hold up. <laughs> How many generators do you have for the record? <laughs> How many generators? Yes. <laughs> Could you get that from the um, we'll generators. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I know how many, how many mobile boilers we have. Um, we're getting the number of generators for you okay. right, right now. We already spoke about, we did actually about the mobile boilers. Well, I, I, that was in my testimony. Currently we have 62 either in place or on standby. Right. So oh. again, what we're doing um, like a, a, um, a capital project to replace the heating plant, we install mobile units to run the system, uh, but we also have uh, mobile units that we've purchased uh, in the event of a building or a, a outage. And we also rent mobile units. So right now there are 62 in total um, and we have seven more on order, uh, four that we're renting and three that we're purchasing. And we should get them sometime in November. Okay, and the generators. Um, how many generators do you have in relation to the conversation we were just having with the elevators? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, um, I, I don't believe that we have enough generators to 
uh, right, we have we have 28 generators of various sizes. Right, but again, depending on the um, extent of a, of a voltage reduction or a power outage, if it, if it encompasses a large geographic area, uh, it's just not practical for us to install uh, a generator at every one of those locations. Um, so, it, and also depending on the duration, if Con Edison tells us that they expect to see um, the interruption restored in, in, a, in a matter of hours, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to install a generator. Um, so we do use them um, when there's going to be a prolonged um, interruption of service. But again, currently we have 28 um, in our inventory and they're staged geographically throughout the five boroughs. Okay, okay, okay. And um, right before I close, for the record, I just wanted to go back to the, the issue at um, in Brownsville Houses. So Brownsville Houses has a new BMS system that is not providing correct temperature reading. Thus, it sends false signals to the heating plant, essentially not providing adequate heating. Javier, <laughs> let's take a look at that. We I'm gonna say it one more time so people can know why I, 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 I'm addressing this. Brownsville Houses has a new BMS system that is not providing correct temperature reading. Thus, it sends a false signal to the heating plant, which essentially, wait, heating plant essentially not providing adequate heating. So the problem with the, the that particular building not providing adequate heat is because of the false reading that is sending to the heating plant. Understood. So yeah. Javier and his team will coordinate with Capital and yeah. will do some, some troubleshooting here and see what the problem is. Because we're going to figure this problem out. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Before before Man. the weather breaks. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Um, with that, thank you so much, everyone. I look forward Appreciate to it. working with you during the season. Same. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Uh, please listen for your name. When I call your name, Somebody on our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer to three minutes uh, and announce that you may begin. Uh, I would now, now like to welcome Adel Kiris Vargas to testify. Good afternoon, Good everyone. Time, so, for the sake of my connection, I'm gonna turn off my video, but can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adel hey, Ms. Vargas. Vargas. Ms. Vargas, before you stop, I see the clock is on and I wanna actually stop the clock. <laughs> um, and I just want to allow Ms. Vargas to, you've heard everything you've been here the whole time. Yes. <laughs> and so please, you can just move forward with your question without being stressed about a clock, okay? Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. I actually have a written statement, so I'm just gonna go through it as soon as I can. Perfect. I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> So my name is Adarkis Vargas. I'm a um, Harlan River Houses resident, and I'm also um, taking part of the WE Act for Environmental Justice. Um, and together we are fighting for healthy housing for all NYSHA residents. So I'm here today to testify on utilities and public housing and winter preparation. Um, over the past several years, vital utilities such as um, hot water, heat, and electricity has failed the NYCHA residents, including myself, for sometimes months. Utilities um, outages prevent residents from being able to fulfill basic needs, such as cooking for their families, storing food um, when electricity is out, and regulating safe indoor temperatures during the summer and the winter as well. Um, sometimes it gets extremely cold or extremely hot. In my apartment, for example, gets extremely hot, and there's no way to control it and it's not safe to keep the windows open. Um, not only um, the outages in public, um, not only the outages, you know, um, not only the outages of public health issues is um, also financial burden for some of the families, especially during COVID. When we don't have you no know, electricity or gas, we are forced to um, provide for our families and not everybody has that um, opportunity to do so. 
So I'm basically here to say that as a New York City um, housing restaurant, we are entitled and we deserve to have the same um, the same um, service and response as other public um, residents. And um, we deserve the same rights to be, you know, to have a, a decent and healthy place to live. And we want to help NYSHA Constable to make sure that the response time and the preparedness for it, it's basically in point. That's basically what I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Which development are you in? Oh, sorry. Harlem River Houses. And do you use the, the My NYCHA app? I actually do. Um, I wish that it could be more, um, I don't want to say modern, but easy to get around, especially for older people. I don't think it's the, the best thing to use. And also for myself, I have noticed that I have put tickets and sometimes they get closed and I don't get a notification or I don't get an update on the work order. So there's no follow up um, on that. I don't know if they have, I, I mean, they do have our cell phones, our email, but there's no follow up when there is an update on the work order. For example, we have really bad infestation of rats on the front of the building. I put a work order for that. And then I went back into the portal and the work order was closed. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so you heard a testimony about the work orders being closed as it relates to heating issues. Um, have you used the My NYCHA app and then turn around and, you know, so a work order possibly closed um, without addressing a heat or hot water or, or anything? I'm just trying to get an understanding. Uh, fortunately for me, I haven't had um, that case when it comes to, um, so what happens is basically when I don't have heat, most of the people on my floor, because my apartment, my apartment building is very small. It, we only have four floors and 12 apartments per, um, for, the, for the whole building. So um, when I put a ticket, by the time I turn around and come back home from work, we already have hot water or heat. It's already restored. So I haven't like been to that position where I have to put a ticket and it hasn't been attended to. Uh, when I did the testimony, and I did it like overall for all NYSHA restaurants that I know, for example, my mom lives in NYSHA and she experienced um, you know, have not having heat for a few days or hot water. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for thank you. testimony today and um, apologies for not having you on board to be able to testify before. No, it's fine. I was here. I was listening to the, all the good information. Okay. All right. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Audrey. Yes. Thanks. Thanks very much. This concludes the public testimony. If we've inadvertently forgotten to call, call on anyone, uh, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function and we'll try to hear from you now. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it back over to Chair Ampri Samuel to close the hearing. Okay, thank you so much everyone. Sergeant Arms, thank you for all that you do. Um, so now that will conclude the New York City Council Committee on Public Housing hearing on October 12, 2021.